Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this week's edition of Kibitzing with Kagan, brief conversations with people I find fascinating. My special guest today is Secretary Carol Beatty from the Department of Disabilities. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for taking time to chat. Well, thank you for inviting me. I am honored to join you today. Thank you so much. So before you, uh, we get to your career, I want to give folks an idea about your background. So you graduated from Bowie High School, so you're kind of a mm -hmm. local, and then got your bachelor's at Towson in mass communications and history, and your master's in special ed and teaching, teaching from Johns Hopkins. Yeah. So that prepared you for such an amazing career, and you've made such a difference for people with disabilities. Let's start with the fact that you often talk about how you grew up with a disability mm -hmm. or the Americans with Disability yeah. uh, Disabilities Act, the ADA, before that was ever enacted by my old boss, Senator Tom Harkin. Yeah. Um, yeah. So why don't you talk about the difference that ADA made, what challenges you faced before its enactment, and what changes you saw uh, either immediately after or soon after its enactment? Mm -hmm. It's going to date me, but I usually put this right out front. So I had polio when I was six months old. I was sort of at that tail end of uh, when they were starting the vaccinations. And, you know, it was done uh, throughout the country, but missed my area. So, um, so I had a physical disability from the time I was six months old. Um, lots of surgeries and, and lots of um, hospitalizations. Um, I think for me, the difference has been um, sort of the, the recognition of the rights of people with disabilities. Uh, before that, you know, as I grew up, uh, there was always um, the, the, you know, the, almost the, the thought that, well, you know, somebody like her who's smart and driven and, um, you know, they'll be fine. Mm. But yet there are so many challenges, big ones and small ones that face people with disabilities. And there were not as many resources available. So my family, you know, they were um, very supportive and really expected me to have high expectations for myself okay. and encouraged me to do and to try everything. But there were very little resources for them. As a family, my mom, my mom and dad had six kids and I was in the middle and it was, you know, tough um, for them as well as for me. And I think nowadays what the ADA has done for all of us with disabilities and really what brought about the ADA or the champions, like Senator Harkins, but others that, you know, others uh, that we um, really look to as our uh, our. our the people who who did the work on our behalf to make sure that the these rights are in place, um, you know, they broke through that stigma. They broke through that uh, those challenges. Not to say there's still so much to be done, as you know, Senator Kagan, uh, but but so much has been done on behalf of people with disabilities. And I think just an understanding, you know, that 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 we have rights. Absolutely. So let's talk about the most basic thing, which can be symbolic, but symbolism can matter. I still hear people say and use the word handicapped. And so let's start with that because most folks don't know the history and understand how offensive a word that is. And so I teach them, why don't you start by teaching our viewers what yeah, the, the meaning of the word is, and then we'll go from there. Well, like any other minority group, we've been labeled different ways over different periods of time. And generally speaking, what happens is you adopt, uh, as we go on, we adopt more and more respectful language. Um, my team at the Maryland Department of Disabilities, we're very sensitive to uh, how to address people with disabilities. So I'm gonna back up. Mm -hmm. So I wanna make sure that, that you will correct me or amplify or whatever. What I learned is that people with disabilities didn't used to be seen as 
possible employees or leaders in society, and they would need to beg for charity. And yeah. they would sit on the side of the road and have a handy cap. They had a hat. I know. They would put they would offer the hat to passersby as money. And mm -hmm. support me, please give me money. And mm -hmm. And so that was a handy cap. And now people are leaders. They're cabinet secretaries. Sure. They, they are members of Congress. They are all that. And uh, and so that's why always the emphasis of people with disabilities, yeah. but they're people yeah. first. Yeah. And, and the word handicap um, or handicapped is really fundamentally offensive. Yeah. Is there anything you would add to that? The only thing that I would add, and I'm thank you for that lesson, because I didn't know that. That was the original uh, for that for that particular uh, label. That time. Um, yeah. you know, as I was in the field from the late 70s through today, um, I, what I, we have concentrated on is people first language. So right. we we always that was that gets back to my, you know, we want to know what you want as a person with a disability to be yes. referred to as first of all as carol as carol, yeah, as, yeah right or as your title or is that yeah yes. right exactly yes. yeah so but that um but i think that really what we've found today is with the um, disability pride movement which has mm -hmm. been recent you know sort of recent um at least coming to the forefront but we're finding that the people with disabilities no, don't necessarily want to be referred to as people with, but they want to be referred to as a disabled person or an autistic person. So we just try to figure out what's the what's the respectful way to work and to deal, you know, to, to, to discuss things with you. Um, and so, so I, was the taught, I was taught people with autism, people with epilepsy, but again, always the people first. But let's move on. But but mm -hmm. words matter and. Uh, one of the things I did, and I talked to Secretary Chowdhury of the Department of General Services about this, I saw a sign that had handicapped parking, and I wrote a letter. And again, because of the history of that word, I said, please, will you change, change that? And he ended up, his predecessor, uh, Secretary Churchill, changed every sign at every state building around around Maryland, which was awesome from one letter from somebody, you know, yeah. from noticing and, and knowing the history and how offensive it was. So let's let's move on. Um, uh, you were one of two, just you mm -hmm. and Secretary Strickland, two cabinet secretaries who were kept on from the Hogan administration to uh, the Moore Miller administration. So start by why you wanted to stay on and why you think you were asked to stay on. Uh, well, I was very honored to be asked by Governor Moore to stay on. And um, why I wanted to stay on was that I, I, I love this work. I have an awesome team at the Department of Disabilities. It's, we're small. We have about 37 employees. We're one of the smallest cabinet departments within state government, but we are so mighty. We make so much of a difference for the 20% of Maryland's population that identify as having a disability. So we, um, so I just, I felt like we had done uh, a great deal during the eight years that I was secretary under the Hogan administration, but I felt there was so much more to do. And um, I, I'm just so grateful that the governor kept me on. So one of the fun things I've been asking cabinet secretaries is what was the interview process like and what was it like to get the call? Well, the interview process was, um, it was uh, exciting. Um, I was a very thorough wedding and I felt very prepared when I finally met with the governor. Um, <clears throat> you know the governor. He's delightful. He put, put me right at ease. Um, it was so complimentary of the work that our department had done and that I had done during the um, previous administration. I just felt so at ease in talking with him and felt almost like this that this was, it was very um, back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd ask me uh, some questions. I'd give him some, my thoughts and he'd respond and have his own thoughts. And, you know, it just was a, it was a wonderful, um, really, really very um, 
takes so little time. And I have to tell the story, which he has told. Uh-huh. So I feel comfortable telling this because he's told it first. So he generally would end a interview with, well, we're going to go back and discuss and, you know, we'll be in touch. Right. He offered me the job on the spot. And he said to me, I don't typically do this, but I feel very strongly that you're the right person for this job. And I really want you as part of my administration. And I was actually caught off guard because I wasn't expecting it. Right. Um, and, and ever so grateful that, uh-huh. that he had that much confidence in me. And I certainly, I have to tell you that my staff are just reinvigorated uh, working for this administration. So let's, before we get to this administration, tell me what you're proudest of from your accomplishments during the years of the Hogan administration. Well, I, I, you know, the COVID was a very dark time in our state's history and our nation's history, obviously, but um, we did a great deal of work um, on behalf of Marylanders with disabilities being the, one of the most vulnerable populations within our state, it was important for us to be at the table and to be making recommendations to the governor and his team and to the secretary of health of the health department and, and his team regarding um, everything from the availability of uh, PPE, the protective um, protective equipment, yep. equipment that was necessary to when testing was so hard to get, mm-hmm. um, making sure that people living in group homes and their staff had access to that, to the big one of vaccinations, you know, and making sure that that was a priority group. So though there were lots of things that I feel we did very well and we grew in the, in the eight years during the Hogan administration, um, I felt like our work on round COVID was probably the most important work. That's great. You said you have 37 people uh, in your department. Did you come in with vacancies or is 37 the number? 37 is the number. We actually um, had a very stable staff. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how is it different and what's it like? Tell me, give me an example of how you're working across departments with different departments, because your, your work, your mission really overlaps with probably virtually everybody. We do. And that's what we always say is that, you know, there are certainly departments that we work more frequently with, um, the Department of Health, the Department of Human Services, um, Housing and Community Development. That's just the name three that I come right off the top of my head. Sure. But we do work with every state agency because people with disabilities are served by every state agency. And we want to make sure that they're served well and that we're using best practices. And so that's kind of what we feel our job is, is to um, advise to be the subject matter expert around disability issues. Um, and we also are a bridge. So we have very good, uh, and I think transparent isn't the word I'm really looking for, but uh, relationships with the community good. itself and the organizations that represent the, that community. And then we also have state agency partners. And so we are sometimes the ones to bring it all together. What about veterans with disabilities? Is that mm-hmm. handled in the veterans department or yours or do you partner? It is handled in the veterans administration, but we are there to support whatever work that they have. And um, we have worked very collaboratively. And I'm really looking forward to working with Secretary Woods. Um, he's a dynamo. <laughs> he is a dynamo. And that's the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. And he's yeah. he's just a dear. Um, yeah. I'll keep it seeing with him shortly, actually. Oh, good. Um, so let's talk about one of the places that uh, that I've worked closely with your department. And I have to give a shout out to Cecilia Warren yeah. in the department, uh, who I've kibitz with already uh, quite mm-hmm. a while ago. Um, and that's about our 911. And mm-hmm. we have to make sure that all people, regardless of physical or mental yeah. disability, or challenges are able to get help um, in an yeah. emergency. So why don't you just give a give a quick overview of some of how some of the challenges with emergency access? Well, Cecilia is really our Cecilia Warren, our director of emergency preparedness policy, is really our expert, and she sits on the nine one one board on our on my behalf. And she's um, and I know Senator Kagan, she's worked very closely with you over 
your many years of leadership in this area. Um, what, you know, what we really want to get to is where uh, anybody with a disability who has a cell phone can, wherever the emergency occurs, can, can access the help that they need and be able to also um, provide really critical information to the 911 or the first responders so that there's no um, misunderstanding. You know, that can happen with people with disabilities. You know, we have people who are deaf and hard of hearing who um, experience emergencies, but they can't, you know, they, they, can't, they can't communicate. Okay, so let's just take this moment to say that on August 20th, 2020, Maryland statewide went live every nook and cranny of Maryland with text to 911. Right. So the people who are deaf or hard of hearing or hiding in the closet because the bad guy is out there or something, right. you can text to 911. So that removes that barrier. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to mention 988 for people right. who are having a mental health crisis or are thinking they have thoughts of suicide. And we just have to talk about 988 more than we do because so many people aren't aware. Right. right. And I know that that's uh, where we see ourselves partnering with other state agencies, including the Veterans Administration, around getting that information out. But yes, there's still a lot to be done. I know that you know that because you're, you're again, a leader in this area. Um, and I really, um, I'm, I'm just uh, ever so grateful that we're included because these issues impact people with disabilities sometimes disproportionately. Yes. So let's talk about, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there was a bill that passed the House unanimously, but there were a lot of concerns by people in the disabilities community. And it set up a registry right. of people with disabilities. And I had concerns about mm -hmm. privacy and access and, and updating and, and just so many different things. Can you just speak briefly to the, some of the challenges? Because the concept, I think, is well yeah. mentioned, but the right. details and the details, right? Right. Well, you know that this was uh, piloted and also now is in effect in Howard County and I think a couple other jurisdictions. Uh, <laughs> and since I'm a Howard County citizen, I, of course, uh, am proud that they took this, this move and, um, and that it's um, operational. And it's been so for many for many years now. The problem with this bill um, and the concept is that first of all, registry always concerns certain segments of the disability community. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be on a list. Now, again, this bill itself was voluntary. It didn't require any anything. Um, but you know, it just it's I. My personal opinion about this, and I've talked to some folks that were supporting this bill, is that we bring in more representation from the disability community to really sort through this so that we we can go back with some recommendations to the General Assembly. Agreed. It was also one of the many issues I had was it was an unfunded mandate. And unlike Howard County saying, we want to do this and we're going to make it a line item in our budget. Exactly all 24 jurisdictions shall do this and yeah. and have to pay for it themselves. So that I, I didn't love. And, and Senator Kagan, I think that you probably could speak to this better than I, but we're, we're right on the precipice of some really innovation, some innovation around technology that might be able to take care of this in and of itself. And so I think that's something to take into consideration as well. Agreed. Let's move on. Uh, long COVID. Uh, is something that we're still learning about, mm -hmm. something we're still doing research about. I actually have a friend who is struggling with it now. Yeah. And scientists are saying that long COVID will result in more people yeah. with disabilities. Is that yeah. something you're planning for, anticipating, or is it too soon to really understand? Well, what I think it's not ever too soon to start planning for it. And we're, uh, we're looking towards starting to review the current state disability plan and to start looking at um, a revision for it, that will be an area that we will be uh, focused on and we'll be including. Okay. Um, give me just briefly some of your key priorities in this administration. Uh, what are you focused on? And what's the program that some viewers might not know about that they, you might wanna talk about? 
Well, we are, um, we, we have a partnership with the Department of Labor and the Department of Health to create a coordinator for, pro for a statewide project search initiative. And so Project Search is an internship program for students with significant disabilities in their last year of high school. Uh, and it, it brings together a host business uh, in Montgomery County. Montgomery County government is a host business for Project right. Search sites. Um, and then the school system, a private, a, a nonprofit organization that will accept the person when they leave the school system to continue the supports needed. And we have about 14 sites throughout the state of Maryland. We're looking at uh, making sure that they are, there's a model fidelity for, with this because it's an international model. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at strengthening the current site and then opening up sites in parts of the state that are not represented right now. So we have the project search coordinator situated in our department. We're hiring right now for that position and they'll start to probably uh, take some responsibility for some of this in the summer. So it seems to me like, I mean, I've already kibitzed with Secretary Montero, that's gonna be going up soon, yep. but, uh, but the SERVE Act that is a yep. paid uh, job exploration, career yep. exploration opportunity for people who have, uh, are within three years of high school graduation or have gotten a GED and um, for them to try out, a, try a field and, and all that uh, in nonprofits, for-profits yeah. and, and, or government. Um, I specifically asked in our chat about people with disabilities and he's all in. So yep. uh, that's another partnership opportunity here. Um, yep. so Absolutely. There, I have to give a shout out to some of the nonprofits. You used to run ARC and, and work mm -hmm. there. Um, and I don't know if that is now translated, if that's an acronym or if it's just called the ARC, because yep, it's just called the ARC. That's what I assumed, because yep. the, the words are no longer acceptable. Exactly. Uh, so uh, recently, the latest cohort of uh, students in Sunflower Bakeries program yep. right. uh, graduated. And so that's a nonprofit that gives people, uh, young people with disabilities, uh, baking skills that then mm -hmm. And and customer service skills that then they can take out and uh, and work in a catering company or a restaurant or something, uh, which is very exciting and very successful. Um, yeah, so, I love fun. I love them. <laughs> if anyone is watching and has a, yes. a wedding, a bar bat mitzvah, an office yeah. party coming up, order your treats from Sunflower yeah. because it's the right thing to do, and their food is delicious. They're I was just gonna say that it's the right thing to do. And they're great. <laughs> and they're great. It is not just, it is not a charitable thing to do. It no. is really delicious. So, um, so I have one final question, mm -hmm. uh, Secretary. Um, what is something like the average person trying to be a good person for someone with a disability of any kind? Where's the line between being helpful and supportive and respectful and being patronizing or intrusive? How does someone figure that out? Do you have any tips for someone watching? Yeah, by asking them. <laughs> it's that simple. You know, sometimes a person with a disability will need assistance and they should feel comfortable asking for that. But a lot of times, you know, we are proud uh, and independent people. <laughs> yep. And if we don't need help, we don't want it. <laughs> right. And that's so what just respectfully thing. ask is that what I'm saying. Yeah. And it's like people who are blind, you never take their hand, no. you offer them your elbow and then they hold on to you so they have the autonomy and they can let go if they want and all that. So there's some basic things that I think we can all continue to learn about and improve on to uh, offer, again, respect and support. So, all right, Secretary Carol Beatty, it is time for your fast five, five okay. questions to let people get to know a little bit more about you. So question number one, who is a role model who inspires you? So I don't know if you remember Lorraine Schuhner. Yeah. Senator Kagan. She was a role model for me. Um, she was a parent of a, a couple, several, a few kids, but one, um, her son had autism, has yes. autism. And she also was, she was very involved in politics, but I think she was the secretary of state under a former governor. Um, but she also embraced her leadership role as a parent advocate. 
Nice. And it taught us all so much about that. Nice. Question two, what is your favorite musical genre? Oh, guess folk music. Nice. Um, the old, you know, 70s, 80s. Yeah. <laughs> So I've had a concert series since 2003 of national touring singer-songwriters. We will have oh. a talk. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Question three, what is your favorite place to visit in the state of Maryland? I have a new favorite place to visit. Have you um, heard of the Chesapeake Regional Accessible Boating Nonprofit Organization in I've Annapolis? Heard of it, have not been there. Yes. They have a brand new adaptive boating center. Nice. And it's my favorite place. It's beautiful. You'll have to go down and visit them. And all your viewers, please, uh, it's it's in it's on Back Creek in Annapolis. Lovely. Perfect. Uh, question four. What's a movie you've seen more than once and just kind of never gets old? I really don't watch. I'm a I'm a movie buff. I I, I studied film in college. I love films, but I don't watch them more than once. <laughs> Interesting. Never. No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Well, I, you know, I'm sure that we've sat and watched a movie on TV that I I saw earlier, but right. I don't, I don't go ask, I don't make, a, make okay. a habit of it. What are some, if you're a movie buff, give us a couple of your favorites that we might not have seen. Well, I just saw Air. I don't know if you've seen that. It's about, it's uh, the story of the Nike signing yes. Michael Jordan. Yes. I totally um, want to see that. Tremendous. And it's, I think it's on Prime now, so you can watch it. When you don't have to pay for it. Um, oh, my gosh. I I just, I watch so many films. Okay. okay. But that one is my most recent favorite. Perfect. Perfect. And question number five, Secretary Carol Beatty, Department of Disabilities, what is your hidden secret superpower? What is a skill or talent you have, something you're really good at that most folks can't do? I think I'm um, really good at collaborating and bringing people together to solve problems and to plan. And that's why I feel like I'm so successful in this particular position, because that's what we do. Amazing. Amazing. And no wonder why Governor Moore asked oh. you to stay on right away, because you, oh, thank you, because of that. So, Secretary Beatty, thank you for all you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being such a wonderful advocate and leader. And thank you for taking time to kibitz with me today. I look forward to it. Thank you for inviting me. It was fun. Yay. I told <laughs> you right. it would be scary. It was all fun. <laughs> all right. All right. See you soon. Take care. Bye. -bye. Okay.